This evening's talk is going to be about routes to membership. At the very, very outset, let me say, when we're talking about chartered membership in this presentation, pretty much everything we say about chartered membership can be applied to associate membership and technician membership. So we're not going to prolong the presentation by saying chartered associate technician. Just take the, the term chartered to mean all professional grades. Um, if you wish to take notes, feel free to do so. Uh, hopefully, if the technology stands up, this will be recorded and it will be on the website for you to look at um, if you have trouble sleeping in future weeks and months to come. Um, equally, if you email me, I'm more than happy to send you a copy of the presentation so you have one for your personal use. Right, on to this evening. So, routes to membership. We'll cover the actual routes to membership. Um, that will largely entail academic qualifications, your application procedure, uh, which we've changed in recent years, hopefully to make it a little, little bit more accessible and a little bit more flexible for you. We'll talk about the IPD, uh, the Initial Professional Development and the core objectives. And that's the part of the, the presentation that Toby will deal with. Toby will also talk about the professional review interview because it's Toby and his panel that organises all these interviews around the world each year. And then finally, I'll come back to finish off with some information about the Chartered Member exam, some hints and tips, and hopefully things that will help you prepare and get through the exam on the first attempt. So, most importantly, there is always a route for everyone. But it may not necessarily be the same route that you will be following as compared to your colleague in the office. So the trick really is to find out which route to membership is the best one for you. There's the standard route, and that's the one that we'll be discussing this evening, and it's fair to say that 96, 97% of candidates will go through that route. And it's the one that everyone's familiar with, academic qualifications, IPD, and then the professional review being the interview and the exam. But we also have mutual recognition agreements. So these are agreements with other institutions, both in the UK and internationally. The idea here is that we don't want to make people jump through the same hoops and demonstrate the same competencies. So where we can, we will map our requirements against the other institution's requirements and we will give you exemption where, wherever possible. So two examples that we've got up there would be the Institution of Civil Engineers and Engineers Australia. If you are a chartered civil engineer, if you have gone through their standard qualifying process, i.e. the professional review and the essays that they conduct, then if you've done that, you do not have to go through our IPD and you do not have to sit our professional review interview. You will go directly into the chartered member exam. The same applies with Engineers Australia. If you've gone through their standard qualifying process, you're exempt from our IPD and the interview. And you go through to the exam. So if you are professionally qualified with another engineering body, either in the UK or internationally, it is always worth checking to see whether there is a mutual recognition agreement that you can take advantage of. Another slightly different route is the comparability route. So the comparability route uh, basically means if you have taken examinations, structural engineering exams, with another organisation, We've mapped those examinations to the chartered member exam. And basically, rather than taking the full seven-hour exam, you will take what's known as a supplementary exam. It's a shortened exam focusing purely on conceptual design. The three organisations that we have mapped thus far would be China. So that's through the PQRC Class 1 Registered Structural Engineers. They take two eight-hour exams to actually become... Um, class 1 structural engineers in China. We've mapped that exam against our chartered member exam and you will sit a shortened chartered exam or supplementary exam if you are already professionally qualified in China. The other countries, Singapore and if you are SE licensed in the States. So basically we've taken their exams, mapped them against our exam and you'll take a shortened supplementary exam as part of your qualifying process. If you are working in a research and development uh, area, environment, normally you're looking at academics uh, for this particular route, then you might like to go through the research and development route. 
The idea is the sort of work that you're undertaking, very much at the forefront of research, means that taking the chartered member exam is not the best vehicle for you to demonstrate your chartered <coughs> member competencies. So there is a slightly different route for those who are involved in research and development, and essentially you still take the professional review interview, but rather than sitting the CM exam, you will have a research review. That's where a panel will look at all the research, the books, the publications that you've produced, and make a judgment as to whether or not your competence is at the chartered member level. So, if we were to look at that in the diagram, straight down the middle is your standard route. You have your academic base for chartered member, you have your IPD for chartered member, you take the PRI, the exam, you can actually change the order in which you take the interview and the exam, but ultimately, if you've satisfied all of those requirements, you will be elected MI Structee. If you are professionally qualified with the ICE, Engineers Australia, IPENS, uh, Engineers Ireland, those sorts of organisations, you still need the academic base, but you don't have to worry about our IPD and the interview, you go straight through to the chartered member exam. If you are, have passed the exams in the US, in China or in Singapore, academic base, IPD, do your interview, you are exempt from our exam, you take a comparability supplementary exam, and again you're elected through to chartered membership. And on the far left hand side there you can see the research route. As I've said, when you're looking at all of these different routes to membership, you need to identify which one's the best for you. We will have around about 1,100, 1,150 candidates going through this, the standard route per year. So in our two exam sittings, about 1,150 exam candidates. There are maybe four candidates a year who come through the research route. So you can see it's very much uh, different volumes coming through the different routes. But we have all of these different routes because we recognise that people will be working in different environments, will have already gone through some professional processes with other institutions around the world. And we want to make sure the assessments that we have are appropriate. So you need to find out the best route for you. If you have any queries at all, always contact the membership department. Just straight away, contact the institution, the membership department, say, I am qualified X, Y, and Z. Can I get any exemption from the process? And we'll be able to tell you yes or no. So, onto the standard route. And as I said, there are three steps to becoming professionally qualified. You must satisfy the academic base. You must satisfy the IPD requirements. And then you must pass the professional review. And the professional review, as you all know, is a two-part process the examination and the interview. So, academic requirements. What do you need to uh, become a chartered member with the institution? You need a, an MEng or the equivalent. So an accredited MEng degree, great, but if you don't have that accredited MEng degree, you have various options as to how you might still satisfy that academic requirement. So if you have a, a bachelor's degree, a BEng honours, that is accredited as partly satisfying the chartered requirement, well then you can have that BEng honours and you can just go on and sit our chartered member exam. That will act as the further learning that you need to satisfy your academic requirement. So probably the most straightforward and simple way of satisfying the academic needs of the institution. If you want to go on to university and you want to study an MSc, maybe you have a real interest in bridges or steel or whatever it may be, great. Study an accredited MSc. An accredited BEng and an accredited MSc satisfies the academic requirements. Um, if you don't want to study that MSc, there is another route which has effectively been superseded by the, the chartered member exam option. But in the past, members could choose to write a report saying... These are projects that I've worked on and these are the, the technical learning that I've gained from these projects and that equates to what I would have done to a master's level. That route is largely defunct now because most people will say I've got the bachelor's degree so I can go on and study the chartered member exam. If you don't have an accredited BN Johnners degree then the technical report route becomes an option. So you just use your experiential learning to say this is what I've learned in the workplace when I add it on to my formal academic learning, that equates to a master's, hopefully. So, 
That's how you can satisfy the academic requirements of the institution for chartered membership. If you're looking for associate membership, then the academic requirement is slightly different and you're looking at a BSc ordinary degree standard. So, are my qualifications accredited? Um, many, 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 many years ago, uh, we would have simply said, look on the JBM website, which is the Joint Board of Moderators website, that will list all the degrees that this institution has accredited. So the Joint Board of Moderators was formed around about 40, 45 years ago. Uh, teams of members from the civils, the two transport institutions and this institution will go and visit universities, spend two or three days at that university and make a judgment as to whether the course is meeting our standards or not. All of those accredited degrees will be listed on that website. Most of the activity that the JBM undertakes is UK based, but very occasionally the JBM will undertake an international visit, generally where there is some sort of historical legacy sort of relationship with that part of the world. If you are from a part of the world outside the UK, but mainland Europe, then you're going to look at the Fiani Index. So this is a pan-European uh, database. All the different countries around Europe will say, here's the courses that we accredited, put it onto that particular database. We will look for courses that are in civil and structural engineering. And we want them to be what's known as second cycle degrees. So in most European countries, that means it's a five-year degree, and we want the title to have civil or structural. Um, where that is the case, you know, I've got a degree from the University of X in Germany, and it's a five-year program, the first part being a three-year degree, second part being the two-year specialist master's element, and there's civil or structural somewhere in the title, fantastic, it's automatic, we can say you are accredited. Very occasionally, uh, in mainland Europe, courses will be called something slightly different, um, you know, things will be lost in translation. So, for example, it might say building engineering. Now, in building engineering in the UK, you might think, well, that's CIVC. That's the building services. Are they talking about that sort of thing? So you have to be very careful about the titles of the degree. If it doesn't contain civil and structural, then we need to look at it in a little bit more detail, and I'll come on to that in a minute or two. So we've covered the UK predominantly with JBM. You've got Europe through Fiani. Then you've got something called the Washington Accord. And the Washington Accord has multiple signatories now, but basically it covers pretty much the rest of the world other than South America. So Canada and the States will be covered under the Washington Accord. The Republic of Ireland, um, Singapore, Malaysia, Australia, New Zealand, um, Korea. There's about 16 or 17 countries where their degrees are recognised under the Washington Accord. So again, if you come from a part of the world that is covered by the Washington Accord, your qualification will be automatically recognised. So pretty much wherever you are around the world, most countries we will be able to look on those databases and work out if your degree is accredited or not. If you are unsure about whether your qualification or combination of qualifications are accredited, contact the institution. This, by far and away, is the one area where most people encounter difficulties. They think, oh, my qualification must be accredited, it's a master's. And they go through the whole process of getting their IPD, preparing for the interview, preparing for the exam, they submit their application, and then they find out that their degree is not accredited. Now, it doesn't mean it's not good enough, just means it hasn't been accredited. It's not automatically recognised. So always check the status of your academic qualifications. Now, if you do not have an accredited or a recognised degree, so it's not on one of those databases on the previous slides, don't worry. It doesn't mean there's a problem with your degree. In most cases, it simply means the institution or a similar sort of body has not been to your university to accredit your qualifications. So a classic example of this would have been India some years ago. There are around about a thousand universities in India that run civil and structural engineering courses. And there is no way 
that this institution would have the resources to actually go off to India and accredit a thousand universities. Simply not possible logistically. Um, and I'd never get back home uh, to, to see my wife. Uh, she'd probably be happy about that. But um, simply not going to happen. So what we had was a situation that people were going to very, very good universities, you know, IIT this, IIT that, brilliant. But we couldn't automatically recognise or accredit the degree because we'd never been to the university. So straight away, those people would say, well, what do you mean my degree's not accredited or not recognised? This is one of the top eight universities in India. What's the problem? It's not a problem with quality. It's just the process that we have to go through. So in those circumstances, we would say to the candidate, we are going to look at your academic qualifications on an individual case basis. We're going to take your degree, we're going to take your transcripts, we're going to look at the modules you've studied, we're going to compare that against what we'd expect to see in an accredited MEng degree, and then we'll tell you whether your degree qualification meets our requirements or not. In most cases it will. Occasionally you'll get a, a, a set of qualifications where maybe there wasn't enough geotechnics or there wasn't enough materials or there wasn't enough structural analysis. If that's the case, if there's a deficiency in some way, we would say to the candidate, you've got a good degree, but you need a little bit more in this area, and we discuss with the candidates how to make up that very small deficiency. So, hopefully your degrees will be recognised or accredited under one of the agreements. Great. If not, you go through this individual case procedure. Panel of people will look at your qualifications on an individual case basis, and then hopefully tell you that you meet the institution's requirements. So, that's the academic side of things covered. Um, on to the application procedure. Now, as I said earlier, over the last couple of years, we've looked at the process, the application process, and we've tried to be more candidate focused. So think about what makes life easier for you. Some years ago, uh, we decided having two exams a year would be a good step. So previously, we used to hold the exam just once a year in April. Uh, feedback from the young members, panels, and groups around the country and around the world um, basically said, it's bad enough that you fail the exam. The fact that you have to wait a year to sit it again is really quite upsetting. So two exams a year gives you more flexibility to choose the best option for you. What we've also done is given you flexibility in how you choose to sit the interview and the exam. So before, you had to sit the interview first before you could progress onto the exam. Now you choose. So if you want to choose the exam first, great, sit the exam. If you want to choose the interview first, fine. If you want to basically sit them in parallel, clearly not on the same day, but roughly around about the same time, again, that's up to you. So what we now have is an expression of interest form. You can submit it at any time of the year. So there's no deadline as such, all this form says is, hello, I'm Darren, and I would like to sit just the professional review interview, or I would like to sit the exam, or I would like to sit both. So you have options. And then we will take that form, we know roughly what you want to do, and we will put you in to the first available interview or the first available exam. Now, where deadlines come in, it's really a case of um, deadlines for the exam. So deadlines for the interviews, making sure there is sufficient time to process your application so you can apply for the interviews and the exam. So clearly, if you're looking for a July exam, we need your expression of interest form by the 1st of April. That gives us enough time to process it, get you into the exam, get you set up. Again, if you're going for a January exam, you need to be looking at the 1st of October as a deadline. Complete the forms in full. Toby will cover this in a, a little bit more detail. But if you've got a work number, a home number, a mobile number, please list them all down because sometimes your reviewers will need to contact you to discuss the best time for organising your interview. So the more communication um, opportunities we have, the better. As I've said, you can indicate what you want to do, interview, exam or both and we'll put you into the first available sitting depending on your preferences. So here is perhaps a model timetable. 
So if you were to submit your expression of interest form on the 1st of April, the deadline for your exam would have been the 31st of May. You would have sat the chartered member exam on the 4th of July. You then need to submit your professional review interview documentation, the next deadline for that being the 1st of September. You would be interviewed around about November or December. The exam results would be released in October of 2019. The PRI results released around about January 2020. And assuming you pass the interview and the exam, you'd be elected in February of 2020. So what we've tried to do now is give you the flexibility to take the interview and the exam in whatever option you want or whichever order you want, uh, and also potentially shorten the timetable it takes to get through both the interview and the exam and ultimately get elected as a chartered structural engineer. So, the professional review interview timetable. The professional review session has not changed. So there is still one interview session a year. It, you don't get the opportunity to say, oh, I'm sending in my EOI form in February and I want to be interviewed in April. No. All the regional groups will organise their professional review interviews roughly at the same time. And that, generally speaking, is from October through to December. Sometimes it creeps into January. So if you want to go for your professional review interview, you want to make sure that you're submitting your application on the 1st of September and then you're ready for your interview sometime between October and January. Southeastern counties, I believe, are November. Is yes. that correct? Yeah. So you'll be interviewed in November if you are in southeastern counties. If you're part of the North Thames group, they tend to hold all their interviews here over one or two days. And again, that's normally end of November, beginning of December when they organise that. Okay. So that concludes the, the first part of this evening's talk where we've covered academic qualifications and the application process itself. Toby, who is a very experienced reviewer and acted as coordinator for the Southeastern Counties for some time, most importantly is now chairman of the application and professional review panel, so looks at this process internationally and will handle over 500 applications and interviews a year. He will now give you a reviewer's perspective and some hints and tips as to how to make friends with your reviewers. Over to you, Toby. Bear with me, I'm just trying to warm all Right. So, yeah, so professional review panel, we kind of look after all applications, so from technicians all the way right through to the fellows. Um, technicians and fellows we review as the panel. Um, chartered members then sort of go out, you do the exam, and you also have your PRI coordinators, so they're done outside. Now, first part is the initial professional development. So this is comprising the skills that you develop by actually practicing as a structural engineer. So it kind of covers the first bit you do up until you become chartered. After that, it becomes CPD. So that's your continuous professional development. And the guidelines we work to are, are really simple. Everyone has the same. Professional reviewers use the same book as you need. And you can download the IPD regulations for whatever grade of membership you're going for straight off the website. So pretty easy to find if you just look up the IPD regulations. Um, it's moved around a little bit, but uh, the link's up the top there. And really, provided you've read that, you've got exactly the same information as your reviewers. So, core objectives, they're split into 13 um, in sort of three different categories, and you must satisfy all 13. So there's no sort of pass mark or anything like that. You have to satisfy each one. So personal are objectives 1.1 and 1.2, so that's knowledge of the institution and your communication skills. Then we have the engineering skills, which is much more your day-to-day -day job. And then there's the sort of slightly stretched skills of management and commercial, where we're expecting you to have a little bit more knowledge about how everything works as a professional engineer. Because the standard as a charter professional engineer is really the point where you can be off on your own representing the institution as an engineer. So once you get to that point, you can have your own practice and everything like that. And we expect you to have a lot of the skills that you'll need to do that. So standards fairly sort of standard sort of 
industry-wide, so same as the civil engineers, A for appreciation, K for knowledge, E for experience, and B for ability, obviously. Uh, we still haven't quite worked out a new word for the last one, have we? So an appreciation is just, it's almost a knowledge that the, the subject exists. Um, a little bit of an understanding how it may affect or integrate with the other ones, but it's really the lowest level of knowledge that we expect you to have. A knowledge is then sort of an understanding of the subject. You might not be able to do the things in this subject on your own. You might require a little bit of supervision, but it's kind of the next level up. Experience then is kind of your day-to-day -day sort of meat of your work. So this is um, able to carry out the subject independently, but with a little bit of supervision. And ability is the really sort of high-level engineering ones where we're expecting you to be able to do things and supervise others and bring up the next level of engineers. So three routes for demonstrating achievement of IPD. Um, individually managed. So this is the closest we get to a sort of supported and, and sort of mentored approach. We have accredited training schemes, which are sort of a bit rare and sort of few and far between. And then we have the one that pretty much 95% of the applications we have, which is the wait five years, throw in a portfolio at the end, retrospectively collated IPD. So with your individually managed IPD, um, we would expect everybody to have a mentor. And there's guidance from the institution if you're trying to find out you're a mentor or somebody at work needs explanations of what you need to do, there is guidance there on how to be a good mentor to somebody. So you should meet your mentor on a quarterly basis, and you'll be completing a diary as you go. You'll be completing quarterly report forms, which are nothing like civil engineering quarterly report forms. They're short, real summaries of what you've done, what objectives you've covered, and where you are, so that you can sort of keep track of what your training is doing as you go. And then a progress summary record, which kind of gives you a sort of instant visual idea of where you're going. So this forces you to be methodical and keep track of things as you go so that you don't get the retrospectively collated nightmare of you've moved country, you've moved company, you can't get access to the projects, you can't put evidence in your portfolio. So keep it as you go, and then when you collect it all together at the end, it's so much easier. Um, it allows you to assess your progress, and it, assess, it allows you to assess your weaknesses so that when you're completing your portfolio, you're not sitting there going, I'm not sure I've completed this. You should know months, years in advance of where your weaknesses are, and it gives you a chance to talk to someone at work about how you address those problems. And finally, some of the reviewers really like it because it means your training's been structured and as you've been working, someone's been supervising or keeping an eye on you as you go, and so that they know that someone, sort of you meet the reviewer for one hour, this means that they know that someone else has been keeping an eye on you for three or four years. And it, it does sort of carry a lot of weight with some of the reviewers. So, quarterly report forms, keep them brief. I really, it shouldn't need to be more than one side of A4. So you've got a chance there for each of the objectives or each of the sort of categories of objectives. And it's a case of trying to spell out sort of what you think you've done towards each one. So in this case, it looks like sort of a fairly early stage of someone's development. They've been to a couple of institution meetings. They can note them down. Um, and they sort of seem to have put down sort of working on something to, to develop a bit of communication skill. So that, that means sort of in three years' time, when they've forgotten entirely what they've done sort of last week, they've got a real list of all of that evidence and they can put in sort of whatever certificates they feel like they need, any presentations, any sort of drawings or stuff that they produced so that they've got all the evidence to hand at the end. Then development action plan, kind of an opportunity for you to write in what you think you're going to do next time, sort of notes to self really of what you want to be carrying out next time, and then a chance for the mentor to put their comments in. And this is their opportunity to say, yep, I agree, I think they, they're sort of meeting this standard, and that... Um, and, and also sort of give some steer as to, as to what the candidate should be looking at to do in the next quarter. Your progress summary record, and we don't particularly mind how this is presented to us. Um, again, it gives you a bit of a chance. You can either do it as I want to sort of reach and, and sort of label it along the top with your AKEB so that you know sort of where you've got to, or in this case you can do it every time you have a sort of 
quarterly meeting, you can write down where you are on each one so you can sort of track your progress. And this quickly allows your reviewer to see that sort of you haven't had a chat at the end of it and very quickly just signed everything off. It shows that you've progressed through and it also sort of helps you understand where, you, where you're developing weaknesses or where there are gaps still rather. So accredited training scheme, if you're doing one of the other training schemes, this is where I always get a bit vague, but if you're running a sort of an accredited chartered um, sort of civil engineer agreement or Hong Kong institution um, agreements, you can use those to uh, sign off the, the first part of your training. I'm not quite what so how exactly does that work? Uh, effectively, um, the idea is again trying to avoid duplication. So many candidates will be going through a training agreement with the ICE. They go home on a Monday night, spend a couple of hours filling out their ICE documentation. They go home on a Wednesday night and they spend a couple of hours filling out their iStruct documentation. And then they look and they say it's 80, 90 percent the same. Well, we don't want you wasting your time duplicating work and form filling. We will use the ICE documentation, we will use the HKIE documentation, Engineers Australia documentation, whoever it is. The key point is, as long as your documentation shows that you've satisfied our 13 objectives. So you do get some horror stories occasionally where a person says, I passed the civils training agreement but they've never done any structured work. Well, clearly that's great. You've satisfied the requirements for the ICE, fine, but that doesn't satisfy our core objectives. So if you're going to use the documentation from another institution, feel free to do so, but make sure it does address our 13 core objectives. Thank you. It doesn't get you out of doing the portfolio, though. No. The only way you can do that is if you've got full-on chartered with another institution, and then you can go by mutual recognition. But even then, still have to do the exam. So retrospective declated. So this is still, for some reason, makes up 95% of people. And these are people who like leaving it all to the last minute. Otherwise, you'd be yeah, doing something else, probably. Um, and if you haven't started, and you're one year in, and you haven't done any of your quarterly report forms or otherwise, or you're not doing any other training agreement, just carry on, get to the end, do your sort of retrospectively collated route. But more important than anything, whatever you do, keep evidence as you go. The most important thing is at the end, you're going to need to send your reviewers a portfolio of your work. Just don't leave yourself till the end to try and find it all. So applications. At the time when you submit on the 1st of September, uh, you have to send in your application form, which is nice and easy, quite short. Um, Two-page experience report. And all we're looking for there is a CV. Really, we're not looking for anything sort of particularly clever. It's kind of telling us how you've got from when you graduated to now when you're applying to become a chartered member. So brief details of your sort of what you've done in each job, but no more than that. Don't overcomplicate it. And then your IPD final report forms for each of the 13 core objectives. And this information then gets forwarded to your reviewer pair uh, by the institution once it's all been checked out. So your IPD final reports should be positive. So don't raise questions in the reviewer's mind. Um, you're trying to say to them, I believe I am ready and this is why. Make them personal, say what you've done, not what your company's done or what was done on the project or what the team did, and be specific with what you've talked about. So again, we're trying to make it easy for the reviewer. So here's a poor example. Now these are, again, you don't have to particularly note these down. If you download the IPD regulations, everything here and, and off this is taken from them. So these examples are in that. So poor example here, still plenty of words, so it looks like it might be fine. Um, they've more talked about, well, they haven't said what they've done really. They've talked and they haven't related it to projects or anything in their portfolio. They've talked about the objective in general, explaining to the reviewer what the objective means. Um, and the mentors added nothing at the end. So you might as well not have written anything. And it's going to lead to extensive questioning. The idea being, by the time you've sent your portfolio, by the time you turn up to the review, your reviewer will have read your portfolio and will be fairly happy that you're already ready. And then it's just now a long chat with someone who's already pretty much convinced that you're there. 
you've got to kind of think of it as trying to put them in that frame of mind. Note that the mentor's comments are only compulsory if you're doing the individually managed. If you're doing retrospectively collated or otherwise, you don't actually need anything in there. Average example, it's kind of personal, says what they've done. So they've given some ideas of the activities, but they should be given a little bit more detail. And giving references is really handy, saying, as you can see on page such and such, here is an example of whatever I've done. Mentor's positive, but doesn't give a lot more detail. I mean, merely said, yep, yeah, they're ready. Um, and again, still only compulsory if you're doing the individually managed route. Finally, and this is kind of what you end up with. If, if you actually do this as you go, so you sit down, you do your quarterly report, and when you've done your quarterly report, you've identified what objectives you've carried out, copy it into the first draft of your final report form right from the beginning so that you've got a list of headings saying quarter one, quarter three, I did this, so that all you've got to do then is add some more words, flesh it out a bit, and job done. So here's what kind of happens if you do that. So they've given examples of the projects they've worked on, they've given detailed information and clear references so that you can go and look if you're interested in that part of the portfolio. The mentors have done better than I normally do, um, but given really sort of you know, plenty more words than I manage. But positive, specific references and really sort of demonstrated that they have been with that candidate throughout their training. So again, giving confidence to the reviewers that they've taken their review seriously. Next, the professional review itself is a two-stage process consisting of the professional review interview and the institution exam. And kind of absolutely fundamental that you think of them as two totally separate things to pass, utterly unrelated to each other and both needing to be passed separately. So the interview is organised by your preferred regional group and to bear with sort of the size of the review panel, Sometimes if enough candidates apply to one, you might get your second or third preference. Um, but we do try as best as possible to, to sort of comply with your wishes. And if there's a particular reason why you can't make another one, then these things can be accommodated. Each review uh, or each pa uh, panel will have a set of volunteer reviewers. And depending on how many candidates it has, depends on the size. North Thames has probably the largest, maybe Hong Kong actually. Um, North Thames have a good number. South Eastern, which I look after, has about 50 reviewers. Um, and the reviewers' pairs rotate generally sort of year on year, so we get a bit of consistency and different people working together. And every year we have a yearly seminar in May, which discusses the process and gets a bit of feedback from the previous session. So applications are received by the institution in September. They then get forwarded to the regional groups sometime around mid-October. So job of a PRI coordinator, if you ever want to do one, is, is ten and a half months of um, inactivity, followed by a sort of month and a half of um, reasonable stress. So the moment you get those as your regional group, we then pair the reviewers with the interviewees and we check for conflicts of interest. So that gives us a couple of weeks to talk to our reviewers, try to sort of identify any early conflicts, and then we write to the interviewees with the time and location. Normally, these would be con uh, conducted within November and December. We are really strict in Southeastern because we have a large number to do. We do it on one day, in this case, 29th of November in Croydon. Um, and the key is to kind of respond to ASAP. It's not easy to change, but we can if there are particular problems. If you're on holiday, we can arrange them outside of the session. But kind of hope if we're telling you now that it's going to be in November, that hopefully you won't plan anything on that day. Um, and then you've got to post your additional information directly to the reviewers, giving them two weeks to review it prior to the PRI. And that's kind of a hard deadline because our reviewers, depend, some of them will look at it the night before, some of them really like to have had it for the whole two weeks. And if you send it to them after the deadline we give you, the reviewers have every right to turn around and say we're going to have to postpone or cancel. So make sure you get your stuff in on time. Individually managed routes, you'll be sending in your portfolio. There's going to be a theme to this. Plus your IPD quarterly report forms and your progress summary records showing how you've got to where you got to. And then additional information you may want to have with you or should take with you to the interview would be your personal development records or a diary of what you've been doing. And 
any further examples of work. Although, to be fair, most of the time, we're just going to go through what's in your portfolio. So you should have everything you need there. Accredited training scheme. So that's sections of your training agreement, which are with whatever institution you've done that with, plus, again, your portfolio of work, plus a diary and anything else you feel like you want to bring as a security blanket on the day. And then retrospectively collated, it's just your portfolio, plus diary and examples of work on the day. So your portfolio is kind of the most important thing. Your reviewers will be sent all of your forms, but uh, whether we'll look through them, mostly we'll look at the phone book sized. Ah, oh, that's a terrible reference. Phone books don't look like they used to. There we go. Back in olden times. Um, but your portfolio is the main thing we'll look at. Examine your reviewer, or imagine your reviewer is a volunteer. They're normally busy. They're normally senior members of the profession. They might have their own practice. They might be a busy senior member of a larger organization. But the important thing is they're busy. They want an easy life. And they want to be led through your training. So really, we want that portfolio to prove to us that you completed your IPD. You no longer have a choice how you present your work. So from 2016, so anybody nowadays should be considering it as presented in core objective order. And reviewer, I mean by reviewer I mean my personal preference, is that at each section you put the page from your IPD report form. So don't expect someone to print out all of your IPD report forms, bring them, and then sit them with your portfolio. Just start each section with the completed page from your IPD report, and then put the evidence behind it. Make it absolutely as easy as you can. Put tabs in whatever you can, but keep it simple. Don't make us, I mean, just nothing makes me more annoyed than sort of two days before having to print out and try and sort of assemble it myself. The IPD regulations highlighted earlier contain all of the portfolio guidance. Each portfolio should include the portfolio checklist to make sure you've included everything. And it's a maximum of 25 millimeters in depth double-sided or 40 millimeters in depth single-sided. We'll sort of explain that in patronizing detail in a moment. If you fail to comply, and people always do, um, your portfolio can be rejected, your interview delayed or canceled. So I really, we're expecting to be chartered engineers and to be able to follow a brief. So if you can't get this bit right, then it sort of raises questions. And here it is, straight out of the IPD regulation, explaining those details. So you can't say you're not told. So again, patronizing detail. That is an acceptable A4 25 millimeter double-sided portfolio. That is not a 40 millimeter A4 size single sided portfolio. This might be. And this is the photo we received from the candidate after we argued with them. That really isn't when you unfold it and look at everything. Um, before your review, you don't want to be having that email conversation with your reviewers. Just, just don't start that. Just, it's, it's not going to set them in the right frame of mind for when you turn up for your review. In this case, they luckily contained a load of evidence at the end, and we just binned it. So portfolio review, they'll find a quiet moment in the two weeks before the interview to read it. They'll be looking for evidence that you've satisfied all of the objectives, and you've just got to make it easy for them to find it. You want to arrive at the interview with them already having been convinced that you're ready, and just fleshing out some of the finer details and answering some questions that they may have picked up. The interview starts with an informal 10-minute presentation of your career in structural engineering. Don't get too bogged down with this. Um, don't stare at us blankly when we say, do you want to have a presentation? Um, it's not a PowerPoint. It's really just a chance to settle in and talk us through your career, maybe your experience record or otherwise, just to explain how you've got where you are and what you're doing. Um, if you're going to use bits from your portfolio, try to know what you're going to use before you start. But it's a chance to settle in and, and kind of relax and introduce yourself. We may ask questions. Um, reviewers tend not to follow the program. Um, and it may just then just sort of descend into talking you through the rest of your objectives. Don't panic if we do that. Um, it kind of just shows a bit of an eagerness to talk to you. If you're asking questions, it's good. 
Um, an interview should last between 60 and 90 minutes. It might be 60 minutes, doesn't mean it's a bad interview. It, might, it means you've convinced us quite quickly. Uh, it might go on for two hours, really shouldn't. But if it's an after work one, sometimes we just get chatty. And again, just relax and go with the flow. But should be 60 to 90 minutes. If you're doing one of the interview days, we really try to keep it as brief as we can and to time as we can, otherwise we end up running into the next ones. Usually start by discussing the objectives where we think you're stronger. This is kind of to knock a few things out early. We've got an hour or so to try and complete the review. We want to spend our time questioning the things where we're not sure. So try and get sort of a few easy wins at the beginning. It relaxes everybody into the interview. We'll then focus on the areas where we think there are gaps. If we're spending half an hour on one of the objectives, it normally means that we're not satisfied and we're trying to help or get you to convince us that you're ready. And really, this is kind of a chance to meet two of your peers from the industry, two chartered members who you'll be joining. And it's, it's trying to have a conversation as member to member. And that's what you kind of got to approach it as. And we want you to convince you that you're ready to be a member as well. At a reset, we only test the objectives being reset. So if you failed up to three objectives, you're just coming back to talk about those. Your portfolio only needs to address those three. You're not trying to do all the rest. If you failed one, literally all we want is a portfolio of one objective. And that's all we'll talk about. So it could be super quick, and we normally fit those in if we're trying to squeeze a couple of extra interviews. So don't worry about doing all 13 in again. If you've been called back to reset, just focus on those. Unless, of course, it's a full reset, in which case, do the whole lot. Most commonly fail, 2.1 concept design and analysis and design. And those are the two that really mark us out as chartered structural engineers. So they're going to be the body of your work, and they have a really high level of achievement that we expect you to attain. So that's where you've got to focus a lot of your evidence. But 2.3 materials and construction techniques can also trip you up. So those ones, again, we're expecting really high levels of attainment. Um, we'll go on to more about sort of what the materials ones includes, but make sure you've got plenty of evidence behind them. You can't ignore the management and commercial issues and some of the awareness ones. If it's in your portfolio, be prepared to talk about it. Have a read of it before you go. Don't put in the notes from a lecture you went to on law and then not know anything about it when we ask you. If it's in a drawing, be prepared to explain what you did in the production of that drawing, whether you actually drew it yourself or how you marked it up. Include markups or otherwise if you're just putting in a CAD drawing. Don't just put in pages of calculations. Um, nobody wants to look at that. And be prepared to draw a bending moment diagram. So nothing reviewers like more than um, just giving you a random bending moment draw diagram that you can then argue with both reviewers and the reviewers can argue with each other about what it should look like. Um, really good now is the structural behavior course. If you've done that in advance, you should be probably better than any of your reviewers. If in doubt, look at the IPD regulations. When we're in doubt, that's what we look at to understand whether we think you've passed. So concept design gives you a full list of things that we would expect to see in your portfolio. So there's no magic here. There's no sort of hidden secrets of the review. All this is written down, and both of us look at it, you and us. Materials can be a slightly tricky one, but really we're looking for you to have a fairly solid knowledge of a couple of the materials. And it depends on what size practice or what you're doing as to what those might be. It could be glass, it could be timber, it could be masonry, but we expect you to have a really solid ability in at least two of them. And that can be concrete or steel. We don't want you to turn up having just done concrete flat slabs. Then the others, a knowledge or an understanding of the main properties of those materials is fine. We're not expecting everyone in four years to have developed a massive expertise in every single thing. But make sure you've nailed at least two. Um, ethics is becoming sort of more and more important. But there's some really good guidance on the website that you can find, um, guidance on ethics that we look at, and example ethical scenarios. They're kind of the things that we'd look at in advance to think of things to test you on. Otherwise, all we're looking to satisfy is that at some point during your review, you've said somewhere where you've acted ethically um, and demonstrated that you consider ethics as part of what you do. So that could be something where you've had a 
a discussion with, with somebody on site about something, and you, but just showing that you, you've yeah, acted ethically. Good examples on the website, though, and feel free to use those. Understand the code of conduct. Be prepared for sort of easy sort of questions from the, from the reviewers on those. Um, and worth a look at the Engineering Council's statement of ethical principles. Sustainability. Still, at the moment, it's a key for knowledge. Um, this council meeting last week is becoming more and more important, and I think we're going to really focus on this over the next few years. Uh, something that came out over the last couple of weeks was a commitment we're asking big practices to sign up to. So this is board level people that we're needing to sign up, but saying that we want companies to commit to certain uh, to, to certain commitments uh, to share knowledge, raise awareness of really the impact that structural engineering has within the whole carbon envelope. So um, we used to be able to hide behind mechanical engineers and their inefficient systems. Over the past few years, it's become more and more obvious, and uh, we're still surprised that people haven't noticed as much that um, the structural the structure of a building now contains a huge part of its carbon footprint. And that gives us a great opportunity to control it. But um, be aware of what the institution's doing and initiatives like this that we're pushing, if you go to the main website, is kind of at the front. See if you can get your company to sign up to it and put that in your objectives, because that would be lovely. Um, exam PRI order. Exam pass does not mean an easier review and that we won't look at 2.1. You can prepare to pass the exam without having really done a lot of concept work at work. We're expecting to see a full folder of your sort of work, doing concept designs, felt pen drawings, and just really understanding how buildings are put together and all the component parts. They are independent. Your examiners, or your reviewers, rather, will not know or particularly care whether you've passed the exam. So mentioning it or not, entirely up to you, but don't expect it to give you an easier ride on 2.1. Make sure you've satisfied it through your portfolio. After the interview, we complete a summary report form. And if the reviewers can't agree and are still arguing after half an hour, the PRI coordinator will normally come and sit down with them and steer them one way or another. We send the forms to the institution, and the institution writes to you in the new year. Uh, normally, it might even be quicker than that. We try to feed the forms back as quickly as we can after the reviews just to get them off our desk before we lose them, spill coffee or otherwise. We can't tell you how you've done, but if you failed, you will get feedback via the institution. So we complete a form, because really we're trying to help identify where you need to go away and focus. So expect feedback, they'll give it to you freely. And if it's not clear enough, they'll normally come back to us to find out what it was. And that, I think, is pretty much it. So now we're on to the examination. Thanks, Toby. Right, so we've covered the academic requirements. Uh, we've had a look at the application process and the flexibilities we now have, and hopefully you have a much better idea of how you prepare your IPD final report forms and your portfolio, so you'll race through the interview. Um, for many people, the examination is the, the final part of the application process. So the exam is normally held in January and July each year. Traditionally, it was always held on a Friday. Um, that's just the way it worked. More recently, we've chopped and changed days. Um, so July 2018 and January 2019, we certainly had it on Thursday. I think July 2019 was also on a Thursday. Um, maybe next year it'll be on a Monday. Um, we're chopping and changing the, the days and that reflects the needs, the preferences, the interests of an international diverse membership. So Fridays are not always the best days for everyone around the world. Um, we have had situations in the past where an individual had difficulties because of the Sabbath, uh, getting home on time. Uh, we had difficulties with people having religious observances. Um, whatever we do, we're not going to please everyone. So we just accept that. Um, since we've moved it to a Thursday, people have said, oh, I was really looking forward to going out after the exam on the Friday and having a few drinks and then the weekend to recover, but I'm back into the office on the Friday morning. Well, 
okay? When we hold it on a Monday, I'm pretty sure people will say, I've got to get through the rest of the week after the exam on the Monday. What a stupid day to hold it on. We're mixing and matching the day, so don't always assume it's going to be on a Friday or a Thursday. Um, I think our exams manager, Fraser, is looking at a Monday for next year. The results are published in April and October, and you will be elected, again, assuming you've passed the interview and the exam, very shortly thereafter, May, early June, or October, early November. The Chartered Member paper has five questions. Uh, you'll be surprised that some people don't know this, but you only have to answer one. So you will look through that exam paper, you will look at the five questions, and you will actually decide which one is best for you based on your experience that you've gained to that point in time. Each question is also divided into the same sort of sections. So you'll have section uh, one, section two, and each exam will last seven hours. So that's for chartered and associate. So the five sections of the exam will test the principal elements of the design process. So section one is your concept design. So that's where you've got to do your design appraisal, which basically is saying you're given a brief, you will look at that brief, you will identify the key issues within that brief, and you will produce two distinct and viable solutions to that brief. So that's section 1A. You will then have a written communication to a client, that's section 1B. And basically, within the question, we will have changed the brief slightly. The client says at the last moment, oh, actually, I want an extra floor on that, or I want a swimming pool here, or whatever it may be. And you then have to write a letter to this client and say, well, if you want this change, this is how it's going to impact my initial design. So it's a communication exercise, but it also means you've got to understand the impacts of that change and communicate that in layman's terms to the client. So that's section one. You must pass section one to get through the exam. Okay? Section two, you passed all the conceptual design. You're on to the design calculations, the engineering drawings, the construction issues, which is the method statement, uh, program, that sort of thing. Again, you must pass section two. So there is no point being an absolute whiz kid on section one and scoring 49 out of 50, P.S. that never happens, but scoring 49 out of 50 and then getting zero marks on section two. Yeah, you've got to pass both elements of the exam. So managing your time and making sure you spend enough time on both parts of the exams is one of the critical things that you have to develop when you're preparing. So, section one. You interpret a comp complex brief, you devise appropriate schemes, you write the letter to the client. The first part, section 1A, is 40 marks. So you'll spend a good part of the morning of your exam thinking about your two distinct and viable solutions. Once you've got your two distinct and viable solutions, and we'll touch on what that actually means in a minute or two, then you give an appraisal and you say, I am going with option one or option two, and this is why I've chosen this particular scheme. This is the advantages as compared to the other scheme. And then you've got the letter to the client. Now, when I say you've got to pass section one, you have got to get 20 out of 50. It doesn't matter whether you get the 20 in 1A. You can get 20 in 1A and do nothing in 1B. That's fine. As long as you get 20 out of 50, you have passed section one. Some people will say, I'm going to focus on 1A. That's where I'm going to put all my effort. I'm not going to do 1B. Or I'm just going to do a rough old letter. Don't do that. Make sure you plan your exam appropriately. Work to a timetable. Because everyone is capable of picking up three, four marks in the letter. Just identifying the key things and getting a decent letter down to the client, you should be able to pick up three, four marks very easily. Okay, so 20 out of 50 on section one. Section two, design calculations for all principal elements. Now, if there's one word that you take out of that sentence, it's principle. This is not the case of can I design eight different columns or eight different slabs. 
You know, you've got to identify what is the key thing you've done in this design. What are the key elements of it? So every year we will get candidates who will appeal and say, I designed eight things in section 2C and I can't believe I failed. That's because they designed the wrong things or it was repetitive design. But, you know, you had a cantilever in that design, but you didn't do any calculations for it. Strange. So it's a judgment call here. You know, what are the principal things, normally the more difficult things, that you will be expected to design? Do the calculations for them. Don't design the same thing eight times. Your general arrangement drawings and your details, critical details for the proposed scheme, 20 marks. Your method statement and programme, 10 marks. Now again, all we want is 20 out of 50. So it doesn't matter where you get that 20, but again, it's very easy to pick up marks in each section. What you'll sometimes find with a lot of candidates is they start running out of time. So they've spent a lot of time on 1A, 1B, 2C. The drawings often take them a fair bit of time. They don't get enough time to do 2E. You're losing three, four marks. Very straightforward marks. So 20 marks from section one, 20 marks from section two. You've got your 40 marks, which is the pass mark for the chartered member exam. So pass mark 40%, both parts uh, must be passed, but as I've said, not each element, 1A, 1B, etc. Now, the way in which we mark the exam, um, you will complete your paper, it will come back to the institution, we will scan it in, you will have two examiners who will mark your paper. They will mark it separately and independently. So number one, they won't know who you are, all that will identify your paper is your candidate number. So no names, membership numbers or anything like that. So it's a candidate number. They will mark your paper independently. So examiner one who may be based in Hong Kong or India or wherever it may be around the world. And examiner two, they will do this process separately. There is no communication between them. There's no chatting. What do you think the candidate means here? they will do it independently. So we come up with what's known as two raw marks. So these are the examiners saying, this is how I think the candidate has performed. Now, clearly we have marking schemes, but the marking schemes can never be so detailed as to actually cover every eventuality in the paper. So there's a little bit of judgment involved here. And that means sometimes, as in any exam, one marker might be slightly harsher, one mar marker might be slightly more lenient in how they're judging a question. So what we then do is have a normalisation programme. So we'll take all of those marks, we'll run a statistical programme and we'll work out who is slightly harsher, who's more lenient, and you'll get another set of marks and that will be your normalised marks. So for every candidate, Toby in his day, back in 1852 when he took the exam, Toby will have four marks, the two raw marks and the two normalised marks. And what you're hoping for is all four of them say, well done, you've passed. Nice and simple. Okay, you are a successful candidate, you've passed the exam, fantastic. The other less favourable but very clear result will be four fails. You know, it's very black and white. So both examiners have said, in the raw marks, you failed. In the normalised marks, you failed. We're pretty sure you failed. Now, occasionally, you get a borderline candidate. And the borderline candidate will have one examiner passing you on wall marks, but maybe on the normalised marks failing you. The other examiner has failed you on the normalised marks, but on the, oh, sorry, on the raw marks, but passed you on the normalised. So you can have slight differences of opinion. Someone might have said, Toby, you've got 38 marks out of 40. The other examiner might have said, you've got 42 marks. Now, you've got a split decision there. What we then do is we go to the chief examiner. So the chief examiner is the person who actually prepared the question, developed the question, with the help and guidance of the exams panel. But that chief examiner will come in, look at the paper, and look at the, the feedback and the marks from the two examiners. That chief examiner will then say whether you've passed or failed. So you get a two to one majority. So we have a process where you've got 
the raw marks, the normalised marks, moderation, adjudication. By the time we get to the end of that process, we are pretty sure that the result that we've got is correct and accurate. Now, the third bullet point there, there can be limited compensation. In very, very, very rare occasions, you could have a person who absolutely smashes section one. So say they get 30 out of 50, and that's a good mark in section one. And say they get 19 and a half out of 20 in section two. Strictly speaking, they have failed the exam because they have not got 20 marks in section two. But again, the exams panel will look at that paper and say, we need an adjudication here because the person is very borderline. That chief examiner will look at that paper and say, OK, we're slightly low on section two, half a mark, a mark, but they've performed so well in section A, we're going to give compensation and pass the candidate. So we have a whole process here. That's why it takes us months to actually mark every single exam paper. But we have a process where we're sure that the, the, the candidate results are accurate. We've had a moderation process. We've had an adjudication process. We've taken into account everything that we can take into account. And therefore, the result, we hope, is accurate. OK, so that's the exam process. Now on to the day itself. So you've got a seven-hour exam for most people. Um, Increasingly, we're seeing candidates uh, approaching us and saying, I've got various um, medical issues, um, disabilities, whatever it may be. You have the right, you have the option to actually advise the institution that I have got issue X, Y, and Z. We will make reasonable adjustments for you to make sure you are able to access the exam and demonstrate your competencies in the same way as every other candidate. So, for example, if you are dyslexic, you, know, you will have gone through university, perhaps you will have already had additional time given to you, additional consideration given to you, and we will take that on board, and in most cases we will give you some additional time to sit the exam. So when you finish the exam after seven hours and some chap is sitting over there still writing away, don't feel, well, bloody hell, what's happening over there? They're cheating. No, it's probably that they've got a little bit of extra time. So dyslexia is common, uh, autism, things like that. We will make whatever reasonable adjustments will satisfy your particular needs. We have in the past had a candidate who had chronic arthritis and couldn't write for seven hours. They used the laptop during the course of the exam. So we will look at any particular issues you have and make reasonable adjustments. But for 99% of the candidates, it will be a seven-hour exam. Arrive in good time. Know where your exam hall is. If you can get and visit, get to and visit your exam hall before the actual day of the exam, please do so. Again, we get phone calls at 9.30 in the morning from candidates saying, I'm at the University of Birmingham but I don't know where to go. Uh, and, you know, well, we, well, it's on the letter that we've given you. It's room, blah, blah, blah. But where is that? Well, I'm not at the University of Birmingham, and I don't know where that room is, so you're going to have to go and talk to someone and find it. And we get that pretty much every year. So make sure you know where your exam centre is and you know the room that you're going to be sitting in, etc. 9.15... So the exam will start, you can read the paper, don't write anything. So don't start writing on your answer script or even in the, the question paper. You will read through all five questions and this is my favourite part of the day because you'll see the candidates sitting down there, they're really eager, they get the paper and they go, oh damn, oh damn, oh damn. And they do that five times and then they go back and they find the best question. Uh, I know you lot will be really depressed when you do that, but I do have a bit of a giggle. Um, 9.30, the examination starts. So that's when you can start writing and putting down all your knowledge. Um, one o'clock, you'll stop for lunch. Now, big change in what we do here. Previously, we said, look, you can't write anymore during that half-hour lunch break, but if you want to read any of the material you've brought with you, feel free to do so. If you want to read what you've done in the morning, feel free to do so. No longer. 
So at lunch, you will take a half hour lunch break. You're not allowed to read, write, anything to do with the exam. Why? There was an issue where a candidate said, I have to go uh, and leave the exam hall in order to uh, administer some medication. If a candidate is sitting in that exam hall and is reading and doing work, they're getting an advantage as compared to me. And so we ended up in a situation where we had to say, right, it has to be a level playing field for everyone. So there was no reading or writing. In many cases, it's an opportunity for you to read your book or the Sun newspaper or whatever floats your boat and get a half an hour away from the exam. Also, key point, you clearly can leave the exam hall, uh, go to the loo, use the facilities. If there's a drinks machine outside, fine. You cannot leave the exam center. So do not go to your car and sit in your car and then say, I'm just retrieving my lunch whilst holding your mobile phone. You can't do that. Okay? You stay in the exam venue. You don't leave it to go and sort out your car parking or collect your lunch from the car or anything like that. So at 1.30, the exam restarts. And for most people, it will finish at 5 o'clock. So seven hours of examination time, probably the best seven hours you'll ever have in your life. Um, it's such good fun that every year people come back year after year <laughs> to sit it. So that's the exam timetable. Open book. So open book um, is interpreted by candidates in many, many different ways. I have been at uh, universities and exam centres where I have seen candidates walk in with suitcases on wheels. And I'm not joking. And this particular candidate had a table here and another table down the side, so quite a bit of room. The exam started at 9.15 and everyone was reading away. This individual was laying out book after book after book, getting them on the right pages. The exam started at 9.30 people were writing away. He was still setting out books. He put his hand up, and I thought, oh, what's happening here? Can I have another table, please? OK, so we got him another table. It must have been 9.40 he sat down and started reading the paper. And you're not allowed to leave the exam hall for the first hour. I'm not entirely sure where that rule came from, but you're not allowed to leave the exam hall for the first hour. 10.30, he put his hand up, and I thought, there's no room for another table. So I went over to him. Can I help you? Yes, I'd like to leave the exam, please. He then spent the next 10 minutes packing up his books, back into his suitcase, walking out. And it is a very sad but a classic example. If you need that many books in the chartered member exam, don't bother. Save yourself the time, aggravation, and probably a bad back of carrying that many books into the exam hall. You will never have time to read that amount of information. Okay, so don't do it. There was a previous exams manager here called Peter Jinks, and Peter and myself would look at candidates coming into exam halls, and we would look at them and say, right, who's going to be the star out of this cohort? Who's going to absolutely smash the exam? Right? And then we'd have another little conversation, say, right, who's going to really flunk this exam? Not the most professional behavior, and I don't do it anymore. <laughs> uh, you don't know these people. You say you don't know who's good or who's bad. All that you could judge is how much stuff are they carrying. And if you saw a person coming with a suitcase, you got onto it. He's mine. That's the one who's got to flunk it. The candidates who come in with a folder, and it's a bit, you know, rough. It's been used. There's purple post-it notes, pink post-it notes, green post-it notes, scribbles all over it. They're the ones that you look at and say, they've prepared. They are ready. They will be in the exam, and if they need something, it's flip, got it, writing. All the time. Writing, writing, writing. They know where everything is. It's at their fingertips. That's what you need to do if you're going to prepare for the exam. Please don't bring in five, six, seven, eight books. It's just not going to help you. Second bullet point, no electronic devices, including mobile phones. So don't bring them to the exam hall. If you cannot be separated, 
medically from your mobile phone, you are invited to put it in an envelope with your name and your candidate number and give it to your invigilator who will hold it for you for the day. Why do we have no electronic devices? Because we have candidates all around the world sitting the exam on the same day and there could be some individual in Australia, they start the exam first, take a photo, email it to some chap in California who then has the best part of a day to prepare. So there are no electronic devices, so hopefully that removes any risk of people wanting to cheat. Um, you do not have expert invigilators, so they're not all going to be chartered structural engineers. Some centres do have members invigilating, but don't ask an invigilator what does this mean or you know, what's an assumption here. They will not be able to help you. Even if they're capable of helping you, they won't. So if there are any doubts, any confusion, anything that you're uncertain of, make sure you write down your assumptions and say, I am proceeding on this basis because I have assumed X, Y, and Z. At least the examiners will understand why you've actually taken the course of action that you have. So the seven-hour exam. Um, you will hear people saying this, the Institution of Structural Engineers, seven-hour exam, oh, God, it's really tough. Uh, and it is tough. It is a very exacting standard that we're looking for. Um, you know, people have to prepare for the exam. But there's an awful lot of urban myths going around and people use statistics in different ways. So all of you will probably be sitting there and saying, I've heard it's only 31% of people pass and 32% of people pass. And yeah, you're right. If you look at global pass rates, then the average is around about 31, 32. Sometimes if it gets up to 35, we'll have a party in the office because it's kind of like, well, good year. Okay, but statistics hide a lot of factors. So if you look over the last several years, that's how exam, the exam candidates have performed. So you've got a global pass rate, which is around about 30, 33, 34%. You've got a UK pass rate, and you've got your top performing regional group. So by top performing regional group, we know the candidate has come from that regional group. And the candidates in that regional group have got 53, 57, 53, 57, you know, one got 73. Now, the cynics amongst you will say, I bet that's 73, if I do my maths quickly. It was four and a half people taking the exam and 3.6 of them passed. No, we're using statistics here where the minimum cohort has been 15 candidates in that regional group. Okay? Now, what does this show? It shows, first of all, that... Preparation is key. In many parts of the world outside the UK, they do not have preparation courses. So you could say, is the candidate at a disadvantage there? I would say yes. If you can access a preparation course, your chances of passing the exam improve dramatically. Okay, so preparation is key. The other thing you have to think about is some of these candidates are taking the exam for the first time, second time, 5th, 10th, 15th, world record holder, 21 attempts, okay? 21 attempts at a time when the exam was held just once a year. So that individual has invested 21 years of their life in trying to pass the exam. Now, clearly, when you look at the pass rate, candidates will pass the exam on the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and then as you go put down, it slowly declines. By the time you get to candidates taking it for the 15th attempt, the chances of them passing it are quite low. If you haven't done it in the first three or four attempts, you might not get there. Okay? Now, when you take out global differences, when you take out people who've been taking the exam multiple times and you're looking at people passing perhaps on the first time, in 2017, first-time candidates... 52% of candidates passed on their first attempt. So actually the exam is a hell of a lot more passable than a lot of people actually think. And when you look at all of these top performing UK regional groups, every single one of them has an exam preparation course. And most of the candidates went on those exam preparation courses. So 
when you're talking about statistics, don't quote the 33% global pass rate saying, if I can prepare properly, I'm getting into the 40, 50, 60%. But preparation is absolutely key. If you think that you can walk into that chartered member exam and just knock it out of the park without preparation, you're either a genius or you're going to be very lucky and the question that comes up for you is identical to the project you were working on two months ago. That very rarely happens. But for most candidates, preparation will get them through the exam. So you have preparation courses run by the regional groups. So most of the regional groups, certainly in the UK and an increasing number internationally, will now run their own courses in their own regional groups. Southeastern counties run their course. Toby's been instrumental in setting that up uh, within the last couple of years. North Thames have a well-established preparation course that they've run for decades. You can go on one of those. If you can't make it to one of those courses, come to the, re come to the headquarter courses. Now, clearly, that's the headquarter option is really only sensible for those who are living in and around the London area, but you'll still get candidates coming down from the Midlands to sit those HQ courses. Material is also made available to the exam candidates, so when you register to sit the exam, we'll give you access to a website and say, here's a load of material here, look at it, prepare for it. Um, there will be past papers, there'll be possible solutions, all sorts of things that you can work on. Equally, we put an awful lot of information on the website for general use. All your past papers will be there. So it will not come, or the exam shouldn't come as a surprise. You should be able to look back through several years of past papers and say, actually, pretty much the questions, they're clearly different, but they're generally the same. You get a large span structure, you get a bridge, you get a smaller structure. You know, those sorts of things. A commercial hotel sort of building, those sorts of things. So look at the questions. Look through the five of them, think about that's the one that I'm likely to be going for. If you've never done a bridge, you can probably say I'm not going to answer the bridge question. So you start narrowing down the questions you're going to look at. There are chief examiner's reports. Show of hands, how many people know what a chief examiner's report is? One person. Two, two person. There's a chap at the back as well. Good stuff. Chief examiner's reports, every year, every chief examiner will go through the performance of the candidates on their question. And they will say, this is where candidates did well. This is where candidates didn't do so well. This is the mistakes that they commonly made. If you read enough of these chief examiner's reports, you get a pretty good idea of where candidates trip up each year. Possible solutions. Not model answers, because there is no one way of answering a chartered member question. They're possible solutions. These are um, papers where normally an examiner has sat down, not in seven hours of exam stress, and said, this is what I would have done. And it looks pretty and it looks neat and everything's sensible and brilliant. And occasionally candidates will say, well, that's not representative of what you're going to do in seven hours in the exam. No, it's not. But it is designed to show you these are the things that you should have been thinking about. What are the distinct and viable solutions? That sort of thing. All of this material is available. You should be using it. We also now have very recently launched an online exam course. The idea here is for those parts of the world where there is no preparation, no, some parts of the world there are no regional groups, we want to level the playing field and make sure that every candidate has the opportunity to access preparation so that they will be able to approach the exam and hopefully pass it the same as any other candidate around the world. So you'll have this online course. This is the sort of material that you'll have on the website. So you'll have exam preparation courses, the actual examiner's reports, the papers, and this is the online prep course, so you can register for that. You get access to the material for a year. And this is just a, a very short snippet, if it works, of the sorts of material in the online course. For the first time ever, what we've actually done is ask a couple of chartered structural engineers uh, to actually critique a question and say, right, take this question, tell us how you would answer it. And so you see 
the candidate actually doing the drawings. Now, it, it's not real time, it's speeded up, and you get the audio over it, because uh, we don't expect you to sit there for seven hours watching someone writing out count. But you will see the engineer doing the drawings. This is what I would have done. This is what I would have changed. You will see them writing out the calculations. This is what I would have considered to be a principal element. This is the critical detail that I would have drawn. And so you get a real sense of what you should be doing in the examination. So that material is now available. Now, whatever you choose to do, you know, whether it's go on a regional group course, come here for a HQ course, do the online course, you might be lucky in your company, very often graduates come together and there'll be a little kind of study group. You decide how you want to prepare. The key point being, you must prepare. You are not going to pass the exam unless you actually sit down and prepare for it. And the reason why I know that is because most people cannot write for seven hours. We have lost the ability to write for seven hours. You actually need to practice your handwriting. You actually need to make sure you can go for seven hours. Because every year you will see candidates sitting in the exam and they are writing like the clappers for the first hour. You know, after two hours or so, oh, my hand's a bit sore, don't normally write for that long. Like they get a break at lunch so they can recover for 30 minutes. By the time they get to the sixth hour or the seventh hour of the exam, you may as well give them a crayon because they're writing like that. And they're literally, I've seen candidates almost in tears because it's all there in their heads and they're just desperately trying to get it down, but they can't write quickly enough. And actually, when you look at the quality of the handwriting, you wonder if the examiners can actually give any marks because, you know, sometimes it's illegible. You just can't read what the candidate's doing. So you have got to prepare yourself to be able to write for seven hours. So when you are doing your past papers and you say, I'm going to do a past paper, I'm going to do two hours on a Monday night, two hours on a Tuesday night, one hour on a Wednesday night, Football's on on the Thursday night, so I'm not doing anything. And the final two hours on the Friday night. Well, if the Chartered Member exam was spread over five days, that would be great preparation. But it's not going to help you actually take the Chartered Member exam. So if you're serious about passing and being one of the 52% the who pass on their first attempt, you have got to give up your Saturday and do a paper under exam conditions. Ideally, go and find your mentor in the workplace and say, will you mark my paper? You know, and they will probably say, you know, oh, God damn, why did I employ you? You are rubbish. Right? But after the second, third, fourth, fifth pass paper, hopefully you're getting the idea of what you need to be doing. You're getting quicker. You're managing your time better. You're in a good position to get through the exam. So what will these exam preparation courses cover? First of all, what is distinct? So, have you got different load paths on the two designs? Are there different grid layouts? Are there different foundations? Are there different materials? Is the stability provision different? Now, you don't have to change everything. We're not saying it has to be absolutely different. But if you just said, I'm going to design that in steel, and then I'm going to design it exactly the same way I'm using concrete, no. That's not distinct. So you will not get any marks for your second scheme. You've just changed the material. It's not sufficient. Equally, there's sometimes where the question is designed in such a way that it would be daft to change one element. So you might find, well, foundations. It's crying out for one solution, one foundation design. Well, I'm not going to change that. I'll look at the different load paths. I'll look at the different grid layouts. I'll change materials. I'll do other things. Generally speaking, you must change at least two in order for your two solutions to be sufficiently distinct. Don't change everything, but one is not going to cut it. Okay? What do we mean by viable? First and foremost, stable. If it's going to fall over, you have automatically failed. So it doesn't matter what marks you got. You know, a lot of your reasoning, a lot of your work might actually be very, very sound. A lot of your design calculations will be very, very sound. But what your examiners will do is mark your paper as an automatic failure point. 
the chief examiner will come in, look at that, and say, ooh, that's dangerous. Doesn't matter about anything else, that's it. Good night, end of. So it has to be stable. It has to be practical. It has to be buildable. It has to be economic. You know, it has to be within the constraints of the brief. You have to read the brief so carefully. You know, there are, it's written in a certain way. You know, if you go beyond and change the brief, if it, you, you ignore something, thereby making the question simpler. If you build outside the building envelope, thereby making the whole thing simpler, you know, the examiners will pick that up. Marks will not be awarded for generic responses. So everything you do has to be specific, particularly in method statements. People kind of think, I can cheat here. It's a building. You just knock it out and I'll do a generic one. I'll tweak a bit here and there. And the examiners know this. They know if you've actually thought about the, the building process and the programming, or if you've just slapped in a generic thing that you've done 101 times. So be specific about what you're doing. Make sure you manage your time and you have sufficient time to cover all five elements and hopefully give you five, ten minutes at the end to actually review it. So this is the sort of material on the website, possible solutions. Question one from 2012. So how am I going to design it? So you have your column-free space down here. So am I going to use a truss? Am I going to cantilever things? Are my load paths different? How am I carrying the load through the structure to the ground? Are my foundations different? So there are, there's so many examples of this on the website. And if you look through them and you look through the possible solutions, you'll start thinking, actually, now I'm getting the hang of it. I should have thought of this. I should have thought of that. So yet more possible solutions. So all of this material, yeah, I've just taken snapshots here, but you have a report from the examiner who did this saying, well, I could have done it this way, I could have done it this way, I could have done it this way. There's lots of that material there for you to actually get an idea of what distinct and viable actually means. So this is your chief examiner bit. So these are some comments from the chief examiner, and basically... Um, Lack of understanding or description of general structural behaviour. As Toby said, go on your structural behaviour course, take the structural behaviour exam, you shouldn't have that problem. Lack of sketching. Poor time management. Every single chief examiner will talk about time management. Your method statements were generic. These are quotes from the chief examiners. Section 2D, the drawing should be in proportion, but do not have to be to scale. And this is the classic one. Alternative schemes were generally very similar, most proposing a change of material using steel or concrete. So they're the sorts of quotes that you'll get. Look at the different questions, get an idea of what the chief examiners are looking for. And January or July, you'll be sitting in a hall like that doing your exam. Well, if you will be sitting in that hall if you're in Hong Kong, but clearly not if you're elsewhere in the world. Um, and you spend seven hours and hopefully you get to that position where you get your certificate and you're chartered. So, what do we do now? Apply for student graduate membership if you're not already uh, a member of the institution. Review your IPD regulations. What progress have you made against the core objectives? Set a target date for your professional review interview and or the exam. If you don't set that target date, things get in the way and you keep on putting it off, putting it off, putting it off and dragging it out. If you're serious about it, get a timetable, sort it, and then stick to that timetable and make sure you put an awful lot of time aside to prepare for your interview and your exam. Any questions, and I mean any questions, however daft you think it may be, however embarrassed you may feel about asking that question, please ask the question. Because we don't want people misunderstanding or doing something wrong. We want you to get into the interview and the exam and be in the best position to actually get through it. Believe it or not, we want you to pass almost as much as you want to pass. I don't enjoy the appeals that we get year on year. I don't enjoy having to write letters to people to say, I'm really sorry you failed the exam. So do the prep work and hopefully you'll get through on the first attempt.